there are as many orphans in the world as people living in Russia, 143 million. I was four years old when my mom signed parental rights refusal papers and sent my sister and me to the orphanage. It was a hard time. When you're four, as a rule, no one asks for your advice. You're put in a car and taken away. At first, they took us to a children's reception home. Then we were sent to an orphanage. This is how we got to the orphanage in the town of Lisva. There were so many children. I couldn't understand where they all came from. I was four years old, but there were others younger than me. We all cried and waited for our moms. We waited, and I thought, where's my mom? She was always with us, but not now. And we waited. Each day would pass, and I thought, when will she come? Whenever I heard a knock, I would run to the door, hoping it was my mom. But it wasn't her. I would sit down with my sister, and we would write, Mom, everything is well here. Food is good. Our teachers are kind to us. We played today such and such game. Please come see us and take us home. We would seal the letter, and we didn't know where to mail it. We'd go to our teachers and ask, where does our mom live? They would look into our personal folders for an address to where we lived before. They would write the address on the envelope and mail it. We wrote many letters, and every time we waited for her response. We hoped she received our letters and would write back. One day, a letter returned with a red stamp saying, there was no such destination. Years passed, and we realized our mother would never return. Many children end up in orphanages because their parents couldn't feed them. Their mothers would either drink or would have died, and their children were taken by social services. I don't know how it is now, but it used to be that in communist times, when a child was born with some kind of disability, the doctors would encourage the parents to leave the child at the hospital. Our twins were born prematurely. Each weighed about 2.3 pounds. The doctor said to my wife, Larissa, you're still young. Your children will probably live about two weeks and die. You can leave them here. You can have other healthy children. There is a problem in our society that we feel ashamed of these people. Families with handicapped children feel ashamed of their own children. I think that thousands of children who are handicapped in orphanages now are there because someone helped their parents make a wrong decision. In the orphanage, we couldn't take any serious steps in life. And we always had doubts about other people pointing their fingers at us, that it won't work, we are not worthy. We really wanted to set and reach goals in our lives. And some did, but most didn't. Because their parents abandoned them, all the kids want to meet their mothers and find a family. They want to be self-dependent. But we couldn't do that, because an orphanage is a closed institution. So we could only do what they allowed us to do. at the orphanage, and we were all invited. Andre came up to me and we talked. He was very dynamic, very sociable. He loves children. For some reason, between Sasha and I, a contact established right away. 
It was intangible, but something happened. I think Sasha felt the same way. You could see that it was from his whole heart. Like he was ready to jump out of his wheelchair to dance and have fun. Children are on their own. I experienced that in my own life. My parents divorced and my mother died when I was 10 years old. And I feel their pain. I feel what they go through when they are on their own in this big world. Alexei was on the team with Natasha. He also ministers to the children and helps her. There are many children with wheelchairs. It touched me when I saw these children. In my heart, one word was resonating. Rejection. Rejection. He himself, he used to live in an orphanage. He knows what it's like. We never learned how parents solve problems. We didn't know what it was like to not earn enough money to buy food. We didn't know how these kinds of problems were solved. That's why, when we graduated from the orphanages, we weren't ready for practical life. I think these kids have two tragedies in life. The first tragedy is when they get into an orphanage, and the second is when they leave one. I remember after I was released, I didn't even know how to wash clothes, how to make money. I didn't even know how to cook for myself. But when we came out, we encountered such problems like drugs, alcoholism. We didn't smoke before, but after the orphanage, everybody started to smoke and drink vodka. All of the girls made their living selling their bodies, and all of them got venereal diseases. We had a scholarship from the vocational school where we studied, and we would spend it all on food in one day. We would buy food, have a feast, finish it all in one day, and then go hungry the rest of the month. And I remember we couldn't sleep because of the hunger. I remember that before we fell asleep, we would get tap water, and we would drink it all and fill up our stomachs so that we could fall asleep. We went back to our orphanage. We were drawn there like flies to honey. I didn't have any other place to go. I didn't have anyone to support me in the hard times. They accepted me. They accepted all of us, fed us. They let us take a shower, do laundry. Out of despair, I began stealing. We would bend window bars looking for food, throw it down, and then we would bring it to our dormitory to eat it. 
My time in the Army was as hard as those three years after the orphanage. The Army is a kind of school of survival. This school tempers a person's character and breaks their pride. At home, I began to think of committing suicide. So I went to the shelter and stayed there for about six months. Then they took me to the orphanage, and I lived there for about a year. And when I was 17, I graduated. When we looked at the statistics, every seventh child in an orphanage commits suicide. And most girls end up working the street. And most boys end up in crime. The majority of the children that were with me growing up are no longer alive. We always talked about what our lives were going to be like when we graduate from the orphanage. Vasya would always say that his mom will take him home. And Sergei would always say, I don't know, if they send us to a nursing home, I will go to the nursing home. Their future is a nursing home for handicapped people, and that's it for the rest of their lives. They live in an orphanage until they're 18 years old, and then they're transitioned to a nursing home, and that's the end for them. They never get out of there. Contemporary society tends to place responsibility on the government. Sometimes we hope too much that the government will take care of everything. It's a consumer mentality, and I think it's a mistake. We should be a society that helps the state and takes responsibility for our children and our grandchildren. If my son has a place in our family, in our church, and in the society around him, why don't we give opportunities to other children? These children can have a future and hope. An idea came to us. Why not open a house of hope for children released from orphanages? They need help. Many of them can succeed in life, set goals, and reach them. But if nobody makes a step towards them, all of their hopes are in vain. They are smart enough to accomplish something in life. Many of them are talented, creative, and capable. When we started this work, we didn't have the money. And when children came and we began to help them, then people started to participate. First, we built this house of 220 meters. It was all we could afford. It became so full that we had to rent an apartment for all the kids that wanted to come. Natasha called me and said they were building a house of hope for the orphanage graduates. Do you want to live there and be part of our family? I said, yes, I really want to. I would drink often. I didn't see the meaning in life. And then Anya contacted me in a social network. She was from the House of Hope. She worked there. She asked me if I'd like to come and stay at the House of Hope. Then we built a house three times larger than the first one, and the resources were found, and people who wanted to be a part of it helped. 
Some bring food, some come to install furniture. Somebody buys a fridge for the kids. There are so many people taking part in the project that are not a part of the church. That's why I'm deeply convinced that on this earth, there are more good people than bad. When children graduate from an orphanage, they have a certain amount of money accumulated in their accounts. They can have some funds allowed to them because they've lost their parents or because they have a disability. And I said right from the start that we would never touch these kids' money. I think they will make good use of the money when they have a family of their own. We informed all official authorities, all controlling organizations, the government of our region, everywhere. We said we are doing this with full transparency, so they'll know we just want to help. Then I saw a tall building. I had never seen them before. We had spent our lives inside the building or on the porch. But they never took us to town and we never saw things. seen our playground, but when I saw these houses, my heart was filled with joy. Because such buildings exist. And I thought the guys at the orphanage would never believe me. Because some of them are not even able to go outside our building. They don't even know what's going on outside. And what's going on in the town, they just, they just won't believe me. I began to do some exercises. Sometimes you make yourself, you have to, you need to, because you will need this in your future life. So I make myself do morning exercises, make myself do push-ups. When the kids arrive, we tell them we're one large family. And like in every large family, there are responsibilities, such as duties in the kitchen, that every one of them will have to cook, that everyone will both have to learn how to cook and cook for their brothers and sisters. This is washing the dishes, washing the floors, so there are basically regular duties about the house. I wasn't allowed to cook for myself. Like, for example, cut vegetables and make myself a salad with, say, cabbage, carrots, cucumbers, and add some mayonnaise there. I wasn't allowed to take a knife and slice some bread. first time Sasha came, and I think at the time it was way too much for him emotionally. 
but time passed, and he got adapted to this. People started inviting him over to their homes for weekends, and now he's an integral part of the community. This year, it will be four years since we started helping these kids. Some of them already have their own families, although according to statistics, only 1% of orphanage graduates form a family of their own. We are changing the statistics. I realize that many of these kids, boys and girls, have never had parents, and especially fathers. I may never be able to replace their father, but I can be a father to them, and I can show them the love of a father. Sometimes when girls come to us, they might be pregnant, or they might already have a child. And we help them to not be in a situation of having to abandon their children. I was surprised because I thought that if a child had gone through an orphanage that he or she would never abandon his or her child. But I learned that it's quite the opposite. We have several girls in our house now with babies of their own. Some of these boys and girls who already left the House of Hope, they live independently, have friends, and have adapted to a social life. And I will not be surprised if we will be at Sasha's wedding one day. I will not be surprised at all. I like the fact that they've begun the same work in the city of Ijevsk, and I think it's only the beginning. I think that this will not only be in other cities and towns in Russia, but in other countries as well. Doing good is not limited to the borders of your country. And I notice that it unites people. And not just those people who have means and resources. It unites all people, simple people, educated people, businessmen. I like the orphanage officials who actually track the fate of their children and see our example. They end up turning to us for help so that we can take some of their graduates and help them. And I would call that a partnership with people of goodwill. We should be a society where people care for each other and build a strong society. Not built on state institutions, but in the minds and hearts of the people. I found that when we started helping orphans, people started to pay more attention to this idea. I think that if families were strong, uh, people would be more kind. I'd like to have a family, but right now I'm not ready. I want to help my brothers first. I work part-time. I want to be a preschool teacher. I want to study at the university, work with children, and go to orphanages and shelters to help others. Vasya studies in Kungur and lives in an orphanage. Sergei is now in a nursing home for elderly people. When I went to visit him in the summer, he kept saying, Sasha, why, why is it? Why did your dreams come true and mine didn't? 
honestly, I didn't have an answer for him. I continue to pray for him and to intercede that he'll have the same kind of dreams that I have. The orphanage gave me a lot, but they could never give me a family. As an orphan, my whole life was lacking love. The love of a father, the love of a mother. This is a gap that's still inside me. Just the token of human attention, simple support. This is what the orphans need so much, just a word of encouragement. Token of care, somebody's love, the love of teachers. Our teachers were like mothers to us. They did their best, they did what they could. They loved us, and it was priceless. What is priceless is human attention.